But today we're fortunate to have with us Paul Gronke uh, to speak in our ongoing series about the midterm elections. Paul is the director of the Elections and Voting Information Center and is a professor of political science at Reed College. He is also a 2022 Andrew Carnegie Fellow. Paul is widely published with more than three dozen peer-reviewed articles and book chapters and an academic book on topics ranging from public opinion and trust in government to congressional elections and voter, uh, voting administration. He has served as the editor of Election Law Journal, PS Political Science and Politics, and in leadership positions at numerous universities. Paul is regularly featured as a commentator on national media outlets, including The Atlantic, Bloomsburg, MSNBC, The New York Times, NPR, Politico, Vanity Fair, and The Washington Post, among many others. Join me now in welcoming Paul Gronke to WSU. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, I mean, thanks for coming. First time I've been here. We're in the Palouse, right? That's right. I figured that out. Really a conference <laughs> recently in Pendleton, the Oregon um, Association of Clerks. Oh, that's right. I have to stand here, don't I? Um, it's hard for me to move around. Let me know what my distance is. Richard will yell from that's the other That's about it right there. there. That's okay. Okay. Um, Three foot width. We went to the Oregon Association of Clerks meetings in Pendleton. They took us up to a winery in uh, at, at Imolawala and taught us about the Palouse. So, um, so this was a course of bait and switch, as often is the case. I provided a fairly detailed, long description of what I wanted to talk about, and then I was told this is what I was talking about. So um, what I am going to try to, uh, um, so I am going to talk about election laws and the midterms. Um, I'm going to go light on redistricting. I'm happy to talk about redistricting the Q&A. It's not really my field of specialty. What I do know uh, quite well is election reforms and election laws. And election administration, and that is what I have been working on for about a decade now. Um, so uh, uh, the uh, Elections and Voting Information Center, where I'm housed at Reed College, just what we are. Um, I launched this in 2004. Like some of you, I guess probably most of you grew up. In. Any non-Washington natives here? Ah, so, and are you voting in Washington now? Uh, so this thing arrives in the mail. It's your ballot. It was a new thing for me when I moved here and it moved to Oregon in 2001 um, after spending uh, 20 years in Chicago in uh, at, in University of Michigan and then in Durham, North Carolina and I got to thinking about what it meant when the ballot arrives in the mail you don't have to request it um, you might vote two weeks before the election and so I launched this center to begin to do research on that area it's sort of developed over time and we really are now a kind of a national center for research and policy recommendations on uh, alternative voting methods, um, on registration, and a variety of other election. We have been conducting a national surveys of local election officials um, since 2018 to assess the threat environment um, and the things that have been going on at the local level. So again, happy to talk about that more in the Q&A. Um, so what I'm going to do today, what I want to provide to you, it's kind of my mission in life is um, I could sit up here and bloviate or talk or lecture or tell you what I think. What I really want to do is provide you the tools so that you can evaluate the political world out there. Um, uh, so I'm going to provide you what I would call like a kind of a toolbox um, to help you think about um, election reforms and reason through the claims that you hear about how a particular uh, change or law or legal change might um, change elections. Um, then what I want to do as a group is help you cut through the static. We're going to focus on one particular um, election reform um, that has grown rapidly over the last um, four years, which is automatic voter registration, and kind of use the toolbox to reason through how you think that reform will play out. And then I'll show you some data and some evidence that we collected about how the reform has actually played out. Um, what I may not do is help you understand the midterms. We'll talk a little bit right at the end about the midterms and some of the reforms that have been pushing forward really over the last couple of years. And then probably do more um, midterm discussion in the Q&A. Um, so the toolbox. Um, those of you, I know we have a lot of political science students here. So I'm certainly going to be going over some um, well-known ground for you. For those of you who are not political scientists, um, in particular, the scho other scholars and professors in the room, you may have encountered some of what I'm going to show to you. So, um, if it gets really boring, kind of try to stay awake and pretend that you're interested. Um, so, I'm going to start with a couple warm-up exercises. 
I'm not, I did one of these for Richard, he's a good friend of mine, he met a number of years ago. So our first warm-up exercise is the PM Carousel in Great Britain. So the first picture, <laughs> Cornell, is Robin Hood's Bay. That's where we stay. That, that's a real picture. When I posted this on Facebook, somebody told me, be careful. That looks like where a lot of British procedural mysteries happen. And so there's clearly going to be many murders. But, um, but the, uh, the, the next uh, picture for those of you um, who recognize her is um, the previous Prime Minister Liz Truss. Um, and then below is the just announced this morning um, a newly anointed Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. Um, so my first question is, what is the PM? What is the PM? What is that role? What is the PM? Is, yeah? Head of government. Head of government. So like the president. No, not necessarily. Not either. like the president. Why not like the president? Because they're not head of state. They do not necessarily have the ceremonial powers of like the crown. Are there any other differences? But, yeah. Um, they're the head of the party. So like the legislative branch is empowered. So they completely rely on their uh, parliamentary majority. Right. So the prime minister is the head of the parliamentary majority party. <laughs> not like a president, but often sort of viewed by the American public like the president. Um, was there an election? So I'm going to hold that, but think about... Yeah, okay, so I'm not going to... You have about 15 slides from now, I'm going to call on you. Think about, was there an election? And in particular, was there a different process by which Boris Johnson was selected or elected, and Liz Truss, and Rishi Sunak? And I'm going to... And there it actually is a reform that I want to talk about that you may or may not be aware of that... Um, it is an important determinant of the outcomes that we're viewing right now in British politics. Okay, the second one is voting by mail. My friend has done some work on that. So there's a kind of classic model that we use in political science, uh, use a little bit too often, I think, to describe the turnout decision. So whether you're going to vote turnout or not is whether the benefit stream that you receive from the winning candidate or the party that you prefer, so the benefits, but you only receive that benefit if your vote is the determinant, if your candidate wins. And, and it only matters if you vote, if your vote is the determinative vote. So it's the probability that your vote is determinative times the benefit. And the probability that your vote is determinative is very, very small, right? Seldom elections are, it's very seldom that elections decide the one vote, and it's very seldom that we know that our one vote is the key vote. So that's the benefit side, and the cost side is a variety of things, not just registering and getting to the polling place or filling out your vote by mail ballot, but learning about the candidates, a lot of other things. So the, the challenge with this model that has been around for a long time in our discipline is that no one should vote. So darn it, none of you are rational if you vote, according to this model, but People still work with this model, and one of the insights of this model is that if a procedure lowers the costs, presumably it should increase the likelihood of voting. All right, so vote by mail lowers a lot of costs, and so presumably it should increase turnout. This is how most political scientists come to looking at vote by mail. I've been doing this for 20 years. You've seen me at conferences. Oh my God, not that equation again. Please no. Uh, but We'll work with it for now. Okay, so does it, right? Does it really increase turnout? Okay, so this is a work that a colleague, uh, Peter Miller and I, who's on the graduate read, he's now works at the Brennan Center, we did in Oregon. Oregon adopted vote by mail in 2000, um, but it had some vote by mail elections in the late 90s, some special elections. And um, what I want you to focus on right now is this little turn in this figure. So a lot of articles were written really quickly after these few elections lauding the turnout effects of vote by mail, um, advertising, estimating that it had an 8 to 10 percent increase in turnout. Um, but if you sort of look across over time, you'll notice that that might be a blip, that down and up. Um, and in fact, Peter and I have done some of that estimates. And now um, our estimate from this work in Oregon was the turnout effects were about one or two percent. Uh, the easy way to summarize this is Oregon was a high turnout state prior to vote by mail, and it was a high turnout state after vote by mail. So when you look over time, and one of the parts of your toolbox I'm gonna to show you is make sure you look at things over time. 
single shot comparisons are generally bad. So now we have a single shot comparison from 2020. Vote by mail had no impact on turnout. Now we got another article, vote by mail boost turnout. And oh my gosh, where are we? So a couple ways to think about a couple questions to ask about the vote by mail is what is voting? Is voting in, is voting the same all the time in every election? What is turnout? How are you calculating that quantity? If you're predicting a change in turnout because of reform, I'm going to ask you to think about what that quantity is and how you calculate it. And when we get from, to our automatic voter registration example, that will become very important. So think about the different ways you can calculate turnout. And what's voting by mail? What is that? So there's a variety of methods of voting by mail. Think about what the term voting by mail means and what that reform means. And then, spoiler alert, down the road, we're going to see a lot of potential different things might fit into the single category vote by mail. OK, so yeah, you're all really, really confused. Success, end of lecture, <laughs> see you later. OK, so now I'm going to give you the kind of election science, political science 101 way to think through these things. So things are complicated. Things are complicated because of, I'm going to give you three sort of main tools, and then I'll talk a little bit about each of these tools. So one is what we call new institutionalism in the social sciences. It's really a very important approach. It's got kind of three parts to it. Think about different actors in a system. Think about the goals that those actors have. And think about the institutions, the institutional context in which these actors exist or behave. Okay. The second part is specific to elections. We have a highly federalized and highly decentralized election landscape. And when you're trying to figure out and evaluate the impact of something like an election reform, you have to manage that diversity and that complexity. And finally, give me my counterfactual. That is, if you have a reform, what are you comparing it to? And I'm going to show you that comparisons in this area are very, very difficult. And you have to do some things to make sure your comparisons are valid. OK, so let's start with new institutionalism. Really is a dominant approach in the social sciences and political science. We often use the phrase new institutionalism. You might have heard it uh, path dependency. It might be called historical institutionalism. It's really used throughout much of the social sciences. I mean, it's really, I think, quite important. It's kind of the m way that most of us, in fact, a, a primary textbook that I use calls this the logic of politics, which is really just new institutionalism. Um, so how new, institu new institutionalism functions, you have a set of actors. Actors are choosing strategies or behaviors. They're trying to maximize the probability of some sort of goal. Okay, so we've got actors. And then we have institutions. Now, I think you probably have gotten this in class before. Institutions, it's a very broad term. I don't just mean the Constitution or laws or administrative rules or procedure. It might be just norms of behavior, like when you drive to... Moscow for the game, what do you do, right? There are things that you do, and it's like behaviors that are shaped, it's like cultural understandings, and our behaviors are shaped by these institutions. And so the outcomes, <coughs> like like whether y'all win the next game, yeah, this is the big game, right? Again, you go to Moscow for the no, game. No, it's not the big game. That's no. not the big game? No. Yeah. I'm so <laughs> far behind. <laughs> so the outcomes that we observe are a function of these interactions, the players, the rules, and the choices that they make. And so here's where things often, when you see this for the first time, seem very circular. We have a set of rules, and we have actions that are shaped by those rules, and then there's outcomes. But then the actors can change the rules, which may result or may not in a new set of actions that now results in a new set of outcomes and then they change the rules again. And it's like I looked for one of these that was spinning around, and I couldn't. But it sometimes feels like this is completely circular. It isn't. It's a toolbox to help you reason through the political and social world that you're observing. And just keep in mind the dynamic nature of it. It's a very dynamic world. So what happened in 2016 may give us some insight to, in what happened in 2020 and what's going to happen in 2022, but you just have to keep this dynamic system in mind. All right. Part two, 
complicated into a toolbox. Think about federalism and, and our massively decentralized system and this kind of geographic and political sorting that's going on in the United States. So what I mean by this kind of radical, uh, uh, radical uh, um, decentralization is because of federalism. So most of the responsibilities, not all, but most of the responsibilities for conducting elections is assigned in the Constitution to states. And most states, not all, assi further assign the responsibility for conducting elections to local counties, and in some cases, even smaller jurisdictional units, okay? Which results in a highly diverse set of practices, procedures, technologies that are used in this country, and within a context of an increasingly diverse and polarized nation. And we know, most famously by a book written by Alex Kazar, that most of the reforms or proposals that you see are being driven by competition with political actors. So parties are competing, they're putting a law in place, they hope this law will result in a political outcome that they want to prefer. Now, I'd like to tell you that they have more higher motives in mind. They do sometimes, but politics is always there, right? Elections are about political power. Okay, so I'm gonna give you an example of some of this diversity. So, you know, we often hear about the election outcome. The election outcome was 55, 45, but you all know that there are 48 states Right? Oh, wait, <laughs> yes, so 40, 50 states, right? So 50 state election codes, but let's, there are over 3,000 counties. And in fact, it even gets more complicated than that. Let's take the great state of Wisconsin. So Wisconsin does not conduct elections at the county level, but in fact, there are more than 2,000 election jurisdictions in the state of Wisconsin. Each has an election official. Each has a set of procedures, laws, technologies, contracting, vending that goes on in each of those two. So that, and the other states that are like that are Michigan, most of New England, Minnesota, all right? So we have got lots, depending on how you count it, there's anywhere between 8,000 and 10,000 election jurisdictions in the United States conducting elections. Second complexity is what we sometimes will call the chain of voting or the links. We use the word chain sometimes because the metaphor is any link in the chain, any broken link can disenfranchise you. But we do have a long chain in the US, unlike most other democracies. So registration, you have gotta get your name on a poll book somewhere, you have gotta get to a voting machine or vote by mail, your ballot has to get to you, you have to fill it out, it has to be returned, it has to be counted, those have to be summarized, right? So there's all this long, complicated link in the American system that does not exist in other countries. And then finally, this sort. So this is one of the many maps you've seen of the sort. This one is uh, color-coded, the density. The darkness here is the population density. The blue and the uh, red and the purple are kind of partisan balances. Um, but all I want uh, um, to convey here is, again, how diverse things are. And so if you put a reform in place and different kinds of people or partisan groups behave differently, or respond differently to that reform, we're just gonna to see tons and tons of diversity, right? So I get invited here to say, how will election reforms impact the 2022 midterm? I'm like, what reform, what election, what state? Okay, so third party, give me my carnofactual, right? The difficulty of separating cause and effect in this area. These are not experiments. Unfortunately, they don't let us experimentally assign you partisanship or experimentally assign you the voting system you work like. We can't do that, bummer, um, right? Generally, laws are established statewide at one time. And by the way, generally, they're passed in a bundle. So it's usually not even one change, okay? In this political world where actors are constantly adapting, right? And the implication is establishing causality is very, very difficult. Okay, so back to our exercises, our, our uh, person over here. So was there an election and was there a reform? I noticed you were nodding. I don't, there wasn't an election for the new one because I think the opponent dropped out because I don't think she got enough Bojo? support. Bojo? Yeah, from yes. a party. So I would, that's right. I would say there was an election. The election was, um, so Boris Johnson ran. It, go ahead. I was gonna say. Wait a second. <laughs> What's your background? <laughs> 
from just outside London. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so there was a reform. Ringer. In, yes. There was, there was a reform in terms of how many Conservative Party members were needed for backing in order to stand for election. For this one, yes. So, so but there was a reform needed. in 2000. Do you know about that one? So in 2000, and I don't know, and you can correct me, I don't know, this may have only been the Conservative Party. It, traditionally, the Prime Minister was chosen by the parliamentary majority. But in 2000, they made a change where they, they have a primary now, where they threw it to the party members. There are about 125 or 130,000 conservative party members. They're quite representative of Britain, right? They're extremely <laughs> diverse. They're, no, what are they like? Typical party member in the Midlands. Um, upper class, um, obviously very politically engaged, older, white. Like, oh, like, <laughs> like me, right. older, whiter, wealthier. So the change that occurred was, so, so this was put in place to kind of democratize and open up the system. Um, some say that that change was put in place directly to Cameron making the decision over Brexit because there was all these pressures. Oh, I'm going to throw it to the electorate and guess what? They will vote it down. No. Series of prime ministers... Johnson wins a strong parliamentary majority, so that I guess we would call an election. But then Trust was elected, sort of. A number of candidates were thrown to these. And I mean, I was just watching them on TV last week, and it's just like they're all sitting around in their little rooms in suburban London. It's like, oh yeah, I love tax cuts. Yes, I'm. Um, but then this time, then they changed the rule again, and so you had to have at least a hundred parliamentary nominations, and then if, 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 if only one got a hundred, that person would be elected right away. If two or more did, it would go. And so what was happening was Johnson came back from Canary Islands or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. It looked pretty clear he wasn't going to, and then everybody withdrew. And then Rishi was sort of anointed, right? But which is weird, this reform, I actually wasn't even aware of this until I was on the radio listening to the dynamics here and somebody started talking about this change that was made in 2000. That, may have fundamentally altered British politics and the trajectory of that country. And I don't think people thought much about it when they put it in place. So, uh, so there's a big reform that made. And the point for this, for our exercise, is that was a little reform, but the players changed their actions as a, in response. OK. Vote by mail, what is voting? Right. Yeah, I said this already. There's lots of different elections, and just keep that in mind. If you're evaluating vote by mail, you may not want to just look at presidential election. That might not be a good place to look. Um, turnout, the point there is you could measure turnout as a percentage of everyone who's eligible. You could measure it as a percent of, of registered voters. And again, in our ABR example, that's really going to make a big difference. Um, what is voting by mail? You mean excuse required absentee? You mean no excuse? You mean permanent no excuse? You mean universal ballot delivery? I think that's what you mean. That's what you get in Washington. Are there drop boxes? Are there not drop boxes? There's so many variations out there. Um, you have to make sure you know what you're looking at. Okay. Oh yeah, and some other thing about mail. Just recommendations on everything. Don't just look at, at the population as a whole, look at subgroups, look beyond the federal cycle, look to state and local, and try to think through how other actors may be responding. Certainly in Oregon, and I sus well I know in Washington, I'm not gonna say I suspect because I've spoken to, and I don't know if you have, the candidates like vote by mail. They like it. They've got a list of names, as your ballot comes in, they check you off. Like they like it. They they you're it, it's it's they like the mobiliz the mobilization. So, so in Oregon, in Washington, I'm not as familiar because I've been. But in Oregon, our election doesn't even start till about 15 or 16 days before. I describe this to people in other states. It's like really, I say it's great. We have no ads. Like very little happens, and suddenly 18 days out, boom, it's election time. So lots have changed during that period. All right. Um, one last thing I'll say on voting by mail. This is the 2020 numbers, the percent of people who voted by mail. It doubled in 2020. Why did that happen? COVID, right? Did anything else change? Lots of things. Are these changes going to persist? The early numbers indicate, yes, that lots more early voting is occurring. We may have witnessed a fundamental shift in American politics that just sort of happened because a number of governors and state legislatures started sending lots of ballots to people and people decided they liked it. Okay. So 
Where does this all leave us? Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> Be skeptical. I know political scientists are too skeptical too often. I think that is right. We're too, but be skeptical when you get this simple. When you hear this is a vote suppression or this is voter fraud, just try to scratch beneath the surface. Understand often the actors that are saying those things may have self-interest behind those claims. Okay. Try to understand different actors, what their motivations are. Try to think about control and causality. Single shot comparisons are generally not good. Be skeptical. It's better to compare in one state over time because you're controlling that political system and all the other co-variation. Um, and really the best stuff out there is just something called matching that I won't say much more about it, but they kind of match different groups over time. Sometimes it's called difference and differences analysis. There are ways that are to do this that are a lot better than this kind of single shot. Oh, turnout was up in 2020, therefore, all right, so now the toolbox. Um, we're going to apply the toolbox. I'm going to all the tools. We're going to try to apply this to the group. So I want to set the stage here for where we are in terms of reforms. So uh, about 10 years ago, Rick, Rick Hazen, uh, he's a law professor at UCLA, wrote this book called The Voting Wars. I, it, even though it's a little bit dated in terms of the details, I really like the metaphor. Because what Rick was saying was that after the 2000 election, the rules themselves became part of the competition. We're not just competing over voters, we're competing over the rules themselves. That's why it's the voting wars. So this is um, measures as of 2021. Um, so states are moving in different directions. Um, the, you know, this is from the Voting Rights Lab. So based on their coding, um, the orange colored states are moving in sort of an anti-voter direction. Um, blue states are moving in a pro-voter direction. Uh, the rest of the states are sort of mixed, but there's a lot of action going on right now. A lot of <laughs> bills being proposed. Um, I can go all the way back to 2000. It's not all bad news. Um, since 2000, a lot of this was put in place by the Help America Vote Act. We do have um, voter registration become a lot simpler. It's not paper based in many places anymore. It's electronic, more accurate. We have more methods of voting. Early voting, vote by mail in 2000, it was 5% of the electorate. Now we're half the elector of voting by these methods. Um, you generally have more time to fix problems with your ballots in most states. They kind of extended the period of time. Um, we are seeing finally reductions in felon disenfranchisement laws. There's been movement there. Um, Anti-voter changes since 2000, a lot, honestly, since 2010. Um, fairly rapid growth in states that require some sort of voter ID. Um, there have been restrictions in the last couple of years on voting by mail. Uh, we can talk about that in the Q&A. It's strange to... It's difficult to explain. Well, it's very simple to explain, but difficult to fully rationalize. But save that for the questions, Q and A. Um, for example, restriction bans bans on drop boxes, um, which everybody in most states where there's lots of voting by mail, people love drop boxes, but they're being banned now. Um, and some states are actually shortening the timeline for sending your ballot back and forth. At the same time, anybody knows who used the postal service. The, you know, the, the delivery standards are lengthening. They have to. They're just, they're lengthening. Not two day, you know, that two day delivery is not two days anymore, right? It's three days. Okay. Um, system wide, uh, things that have happened since 2000, we have these statewide voter files. Many of you may have worked with those as students or data scientists. Those weren't around before um, 2004. Voting technology has improved. Yes, we made, spent a lot of money on direct reporting electronic machines in the 2000s. It turns out to have been a mistake, but the technology is better now. We have federal standards for these voting machines. Uh, local election administrators become more professionalized. We do have a growth in better redistricting commissions. See, I did something on redistricting. Uh, Anti-system change, though, as I said already, there's been a shorting of time. That's not just a voter change. That's an election administrator change. They don't like these short timelines. It makes it hard for them. Um, there have been, really, in the last two years, this rapid growth in what we're calling predatory public records requests where uh, local election officials are getting hundreds, if not thousands, of public records requests. They're just rolling in daily. Uh, they're being overwhelmed. There's been a series of Supreme Court decisions that have uh, undermined the Voting Rights Act. Um, partisan gerrymandering is since okay now. Basically said they can't do anything about it. Um, and then I have a big lie. Donald Trump's response to the 2020 election has been deeply close and damaging to our political system. Happy to talk more about that. Um, okay, so we're going to do our last exercise, automatic voter registration. Okay, so if you don't know what this is, the way ABR works is that if you engage in a transaction with specific state agencies, 
that collect information that can be used to also certify your eligibility, you're automatically registered unless you opt out. Oregon was the first state to adopt it in 2016. Now 22 states in the District of Columbia have ADR. So how can we estimate the turnout effects of ADR? How can we do that? Any suggestions? I'll give you some options. So one is we can compare turnout before ADR and after. The second is we can compare turnout among people who register via traditional methods and via the people who registered automatically. Okay? Any problems? How about the first one? Yeah. Will you explain the problem with the first one is that the states that were already voting at high levels that the change might not be that much? Yeah, a different way to think about it is who's like, okay, so you're comparing 2012 to 2016, and the only thing that changed in Oregon was automatic voter registration? Hmm. Is there a difference between 2012 and 2016? Oh, yeah, a lot of differences. So, so that's right. How about the traditional and the automatic? Yeah. Um, how do you determine that? Is I would oh, it's, let me just, I'm sorry, sorry to wrong. It's coded on the file. Okay. So that we have. Yeah, no, but like, for instance, for me, I was automatically registered for Oregon. Congratulations. Even if I would have traditionally registered. So. Oh, would you have? Yeah. <laughs> really? Okay. Yes, so the assumption of number two is that the traditional pool and the automatic pool are like randomly, but they're not, right? So, yeah. So the problem with ABR is it's not the same registration pool as the traditional registrants. And if the differences in these pools are correlated with turnout, then we're going to have a problem evaluating. So I'll give you some results from Oregon. Um, so on the left, these are this is the age distribution of traditional registrants. On the right the OMV, the Oregon Motor Voter, a lot younger, because younger people tend to be registered at lower rates, so they're automatically registered at higher rates, okay? The automatically registered at lower income, on average. Now, age and income are correlated with turnout, so it's likely that the automatic registrants are going to be voting at turning out a lower rate because of who they are, not because they're automatically registered. And then there's this one, um, and we were just talking about this with the reporter uh, before the talk. So now about 40% of the Oregon electorate is non-affiliated because we brought in so many, because when you automatically, you know, you, didn't, you probably didn't fill out that card to affiliate with you, but you did. Yeah, good student, good student. Give that student a star. Um, you get a card. You're automatically registered, and then you get a card inviting you to register with a party later. And uh, about 85, 90% of people never return that card. So... So this bar chart is a little bit misleading among um, that the, the lesson here is that turnout among the Oregon motor voters who chose to affiliate was comparable to traditional registrants affiliated, but only 5% of them did. I should change this. This is 85, 90% of the Oregon automatic voters are in that category. They turned out a much lower rate. Okay, are we done? So a couple more things. Counterfactual, right? That's what, what's your name? I'm Dylan. Dylan, that's what Dylan did, counterfactual, right? We don't have the counterfactual. Dylan says he would have registered normally, but we've coded you as ADR. That's a problem, right? We, we, so we don't have that. People still might have registered on their own. Um, and then we don't know what's gonna happen over time. We've now put in this huge, well not huge, significant pool of individuals are now on the rolls. And those of you who've done party work or party mobilization know those rolls are what people use to mobilize. So I'm a real fan of ADR because it puts a bunch of people on the rolls who are previously detached from our political system. But we don't know what parties are going to do yet with those new folks. They're going to start to get touched. But how many touches are going to actually activate them? We don't know because these are not folks who have traditionally been part of our political system. So yes, so how many times can we future future? We don't know. We have to keep going through all these cycles. Okay, so I did lie. Finally, just looking forward to the midterms, um, to my overview. Election reforms will have an impact, but generally it will be small. It will be on the margins. Generally, the impact of these reforms are small. They're not insignificant, but they generally are small. Um, margins can matter when elections are close, of course, but really the fundamentals are really driving this midterms, right? The economy, partisanship, 
seat loss, right? That's really what's driving it. Um, redistributing, I said I wasn't gonna talk a lot about that, but I do know some about it. You know, the system has been, was already skewed and it's been skewed a lot worse now. Um, it's gonna reduce competition and turnover. Um, I do think there's a fix for these, a uh, number of fixes. One is independent commissions have shown to, have been shown to function very well. Um, and there's some alternative voting systems that can work to decrease the problems that are associated with our single member first past post elections, such as ranked choice voting, multi-member districts. We're trying to get both ranked choice voting and multi-member districts passed in Portland right now, but man, folks, you're all so American. Sorry, I shouldn't say that, but to get people out of the, I need to have a member who is in the same geographic area and all my political interests are tied to my geographic location, it's really hard, Americans. You guys, folks, it's been 200 years and it can be done in other ways, <laughs> but it's just, hey, who would I call? You have three people to call. Which one? All three. <laughs> okay, um, so that's it for me. I'm done um, and I'm ready for questions. Okay, we have about 20 minutes for some Q&A. Let me just start. Um, there's a big debate right now, uh, our Secretary of State's race about ranked choice voting. Uh, and, and Who's running in your race? Well, we have a Democrat who's, who's the incumbent. Um, who's Jones. a Democrat? Steve Jones? Hobbs? No, Steve, Steve. Uh, no, it's Hobbs. Steve Hobbs. Oh. Oh. Yes. And he's running against um, Anderson, who's uh, running as a nonpartisan. Oh, yeah. So this will be the first time in over 30 years we have a, a non-Republican in that office. but. In any case, they're debating, and the, the Democrat is opposed to ranked choice voting, and Anderson is in favor of ranked choice voting, which is interesting. But so, so what, what's the data tell us about ranked choice voting? Uh, yeah, and why? Well, Professor Clayton, <laughs> using the approach that I provided, why is the Democrat opposed to ranked choice voting? Would you think? <laughs> So uh, what's the data show? The data show that um, voters are able to navigate it. That's something that's coming up in Portland. It's really confusing. No, they're able to navigate for the voters. It's simply a matter of rank ordering one, two, three. You've got to have a ballot that allows them to do that. But it's, um, it uh, has had success in producing more diverse candidate pools, um, more women running, less success um, with people of color though the places where it's been put in place have not been the most diverse locations. Cambridge, Massachusetts, just not that diverse. Um, uh, there's evidence that it produces more civility in campaigns. Um, under a ranked choice system, you, you know, I'll use a, I'll use a, um, I will use a counterexample, is that the right one? I will use an example of a case where a candidate did not understand ranked choice voting which is Sarah Palin in Alaska. So Sarah Palin in Alaska basically <laughs> lost that race because she said, vote for me and nobody else. She was telling your voters, don't, don't vote for Begich, don't rank Begich too, just vote for me and no one else. And so it, the person who won, I'm not forgetting, was running a very different race, which is praising Begich. And so um, she got a lot more second preferences. So that's the incentive structure on the ranked choice voting is it, you, you know you wanna be, it's, a, it's good to be second, it's good to be third. Whereas in a first past to post, it's it's first or nothing. Um, as to why the Democratic candidate opposes, I cannot speak for that person. Um, I'm not as familiar with the Washington political system as I am with Oregon. Oregon is a pretty dominant, it's a pretty powerful Democratic state. And the powers that be in Oregon, they, you're going to turn off the YouTube thing now, right? Okay. <laughs> the you know, the powers that we have, we have a closed primary. Um, the powers that be in Oregon are not that interesting. Some might suggest <laughs> that the powers that be in Oregon are not that interested in there being more competition. So I don't think there's some, so it might be that the disinterest in ranked, the disinterest might be genuinely it's going to be more costly and difficult to implement, but it might also be that it might elect some non-Democrats, possibly. Um, so keep in mind that anyone who's elected now is elected under their current system and it may just be, I don't know how this system is going to function differently, and I don't want to know, right? And we've been studying that our whole lives, right? Can, elected officials tend to be little C conservative about a lot of these changes because they're like, I wanted the old system. Why change it? Yeah. Uh, a more general, very general question. In comparison with uh, England, 
Australia has mandatory voting, and I'm just curious, have you done anything work with that in terms of, does that system, how would you compare that to what you're comparing with now, um, just the primary? Yeah, I've been asked a lot about mandatory voting in the U.S., which I think is a complete non-starter, only because it won't, I just just be both unconstitutional. Um, in, in last time, I'm not a constitutional scholar, but uh, I can't imagine a, I, I just cannot imagine a Supreme Court and just the American public accepting that you're obligating to turn out the vote. The impact of the system, well, they have higher turnout, obviously. Um, and, you know, the impact of any system where you're going to have higher turnout is going to be uh, a, you know, a, a a government that's more reflective of the preferences of the of the people who are voting. Um, I have to say, I'm not. I don't know specifically whether I don't know of any studies that I can bring to mind that demonstrate uh, kind of policy outcomes of mandatory voting. But you know, you're you have more people turning out. We're a pretty low, low turnout country anyway, right? We've always traditionally been on the lower ends. You know, Americans like to express their opinions by not voting. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, voting is one thing, but, you know, certifying the vote and counting it's another. Uh, I, I hear a lot about, you know, all the new Secretary of State elections, the, the one we have in our state, but <clears throat> others where there's some doubt as to <clears throat> how things are going to go. So in your opinion, how much of a threat is it <clears throat> that the, the votes will be counted as the voter intended them to be counted? Um, so I, I will start with the optimistic and then go to the real. <laughs> the optimistic response, and the, there has been evidence of this, when I've been doing a lot of work with local officials, and the local officials who are concerned in local election administration, the, 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 the forces who are promoting candidates like Mark Fincham in Arizona and others who are, um, in, you know, it's kind of endorsing the big lie and continuing to be unwilling to accept the outcome of the 2020 election. They are also, um, though, they are also targeting local um, uh, election officials as well. 60% of them are elected. So there's action down there as well. And in a way that's more worrisome because they're beneath the radar. Um, I will say that what election officials have told me is when people come in with skepticism and doubt and they actually watch the process work, um, those doubts tend to go away. Um, election at the local level, and I'm going to get to your state level one, at the local level, um, and I certainly encourage you to go to, you know, the, uh, where's the county seat here? Is this the county seat? Cool. Yeah, cool. if you get an opportunity, go in. Oh, uh, my experience I have seen very few election administrators who are not really excited about having you come in, talk to them, watch how they count their ballots, watch how they certify the signatures. Particularly young people, they will be thrilled to have you come in and, and, and see them. They'll probably make you volunteer or something like that. Um, but do that. And so I, I have heard this at the local level. Local election administration should be boring. It should be pretty boring, um, right? It's just like you're just counting things up. Um, and it's not supposed to be exciting. It's boring. Um, the people that like it, like it. They like what they like about the job. The, the constant, there's always another election coming. You're always having to innovate. There's always change. You're, as an election official, you're not just dealing with voters, you're dealing with candidates, with political issues. So you're just sort of in politics, but you're in this sort of, what we thought was just as kind of a civil servant side of it, right? You're in elections, but you're not in the politics side. Um, this has really changed. Um, so at the state level, yeah, I'm deeply worried. And we should be deeply, deeply concerned. I mean, one question is, why are you running for office if you don't, why would you want to run for, it's like, why would you want to be a professor if you don't want to profess? I mean, what's, why are you doing it? And so I've asked some reporters, like, I don't, ask Mark Finch, I'm like, what's, why is he running? I don't understand running for what's a fairly boring, you know, Kim Wyman was great, he was the Secretary of State here from the U, very innovative, but generally Secretaries of State, you know, Elections are generally kind of boring. They should be. Um, so it's very worrisome that folks will be there that refuse to accept the outcomes that their own officials. So to go back to Arizona again, you know, the, the Maricopa County, which is the second largest county in the United States, is run by Republicans. The, 
It's a Republican. Stephen Richter, who's the clerk recorder, maybe he's a Republican. And so it's, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's true. We're in a bad way, right? I mean, I don't know. I want to be optimistic, but we are in a very tough place right now where political actors are willing to basically undermine democratic principles as a political strategy, and it's not good. I mean, this is just not good. And we have 40% of the public now not believing the outcome of the 2020 election, and what, 60 or 65% of a political party and 100 members, elected members of Congress, and I don't know. This, we're in a, I cannot paint that picture or anything but very dark. Sorry, I'd like to do better. But monitor their behavior, right? The good side is a lot of the things that election officials do are very transparent. It's, it's at that final <laughs> certification process. They refuse to certify. I don't know what we're going to do. That's constitutional crisis time. Well, I, I've actually gone, because I'm you know, working for one of the political parties and been one of the, the observers. And you're, you know, there's a big glass win, window, and there are boxes moving around, and people in there, and they're sorting through, you know, boxes. And I don't have a clue what's going on. No, it's really pretty boring, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, they, they could be. I mean, boxes come in. I don't know if they're coming in from Georgia or, you know, from Tico, Washington. I have no clue. There's, there's, there's scan. Which one can sure. Get track them. Yeah, yeah, but, but I'm, I'm saying, you know, you can go no, and watch. No, you don't know. You don't know. It, I know. You don't know what's going on, really. Yeah. Um, so you were talking about how like you think um, Oregon and like states like that won't adopt ranked choice voting because they're like a both state system. So I was wondering um, if you think like actions like I think the governor's race in Oregon right now yeah. is like surprisingly competitive because then independent is running. Do you think like yeah, nice events grab. like that could yeah. maybe I don't hey, want to. Why yeah. don't you explain ranked choice voting? Sure, so I so will. I and I don't want to say that Oregon won't adopt it because Oregon has a sort of second city, I mean, I grew up in Chicago, so second city mentality, like, like, we're stuck between two bigger states, that we're stuck between two bigger states, so I'll just leave it at that, we're kind of like, hey, you know, as I said to people at the move there, ah, oh, it must be great in Oregon, I said, yeah, in Washington, they have Amazon, and they ship things, in Oregon, we build the cardboard that Amazon uses to ship yeah. itself, <laughs> yay, um, but they do, they are proud of their history of election innovation, so it might come through. Um, rank choice voting. You know, the way rank choice voting works is that you rank order uh, candidates, uh, one, two, three, four, five, however that be, and if no one gets over 50% of the first preferences, then you eliminate the least, the lowest ranked candidate. So let's say Cornell was ranked last, right? Yeah. But then, right, I was the second. So you would eliminate uh, Professor Clayton, and then go to the second preferred candidate on those ballots, reallocate. Is anyone over 50%? No. Then you go to the next, and you kind of, until you get over the 50% threshold. So that's how ranked choice voting works. Um, it, 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 systems like that are meant to allow you to express a more diverse set of preferences, rather than having to choose just one. Um, and, and for the individual voter, with only choosing one, we often are faced with the choice of our least worst option because we're worried about spoiler. So I don't know that Oregon race. Yes, that Betsy Johnson, who's running as an independent, I thought she would pull a lot of votes away from Kristen Drazen, but it looks like she's pulling them right now from Tita Kotek. And so I don't know if they'll look and say, "Look, you know, you may lose this governorship because of this kind of system." You know, I don't know if that will get it over the hump there. Um, it is a very strong party system there. I don't know. You're not from Oregon. You're from Washington. Not from Washington. Yeah, it's really, I mean, they've got like, the Democrats have a hammer lock on that state. And um, regardless of your partisanship, I think states, political systems <coughs> don't thrive when one party is in solid control and there's not competition. Um, and so I think Oregon could benefit from some more competition. King County could benefit. Well, Washington is more competitive than Oregon is. But you know, you'll notice it in the presidential election, right? They just don't pay much attention to us out here. Why would they? It, it's, it's all over, right? Um, so yeah, the, the problem is implementing change with a bunch of actors who are um, 
currently in power, it, it's hard to, so it might be through a referendum. What we're doing in Oregon and with Rancho's voting, kind of the strategy there, I think is move it up through municipalities, move it up through municipalities and counties and try to push it up toward um, Maine had it statewide, they still might have it statewide. Now Alaska does it statewide. I should keep calling you out, but I know you know this. <laughs> yes. Um, do you think they can ever implement like ranked choice voting on like the national stage with presidential elections? And, like, uh, no, it wouldn't. W well, so uh, no, I don't want to say no to that. Robert, she's probably watching right now. Will be angry. Um, so it has to happen state by state. You can't do it nationally because the states. You, we, we really elect electors. We don't elect the president. We vote for president, but we're really voting for electors. So. Um, you know, when Rob Ritchie, who runs this uh, um, um, advocacy organization called uh, Fair Vote and advocates for ranked choice voting, so Rob and I wrote a um, op-ed that we thought was brilliant. Um, nobody seems to remember it, so I always mention it. Uh, but we wrote in 2012, we thought a way to, s I think the place where ranked choice voting can make a significant contribution and improvement in the presidential is in the primaries because the primary, the candidate pool changes so much, right? So that, you know, John Ed, I mean, you know, we, again, Cornell, I've been around a, a while, right? But we have these stories that we built up our time. But, you know, John Edwards withdrew before the California primary. The ballots were already out. Like, half the ballots had already come in, and then suddenly he withdraws, right? And that's, that, you know, the military overseas ballots are sent out 45 days before the election. So, you know, imagine voting in your primary, but it's for, if your primary is, say, in the fifth or sixth or seventh week, but you've had the vote 45 days before. So, rank, so, so anyway, the basic of our op-ed was in order to uh, not disenfranchise military voters, because it's always good to use military voters, because, yay, but they are, but a lot of election innovations have actually moved through the military because of the difficulty of casting and counting ballots from the mil delivering the ballot there and getting it back. You know, you're on an aircraft carrier or you're in Iraq, it's hard to get a ballot there. So, um, so we said, why don't we think about doing ranked choice voting for primaries so that the military would have their ballots counted, they would be, they would know the candidate array. So that's, I think, the leverage point is to come in through the primaries. On the presidential level, yeah, I don't know. We're a two-party system. It's hard, but maybe it'd have to percolate up from below. I think. Yes. Um, I have a question about actually about Oregon. Um, so, um, in the 1960s, up in the 1960s, Oregon had a multi-member district system in which people yeah. would basically check off people would not from Oregon. Basically, just like if there's four candidates in your district, you go for four people. Um, the 1960s, under the direction of Bob Packwood, that changed to a single-member district system. But in 2011, Packwood at the Portland City Club said that that system should come back. And you already mentioned these four multi-member districts. Do you think that could be used polarization in the um, state where the state legislature? Yes. So down? I am a. Yeah, I mentioned that here. I am a big. So yeah, yeah. I'm looking around, trying to look how many people are my age or older, near my age. So I none of nobody here. Only a small number of people in this room recognize the name Lonnie Guineer. I suspect. So Lonnie Guineer uh, recently passed away. Uh, I think it was a law professor at Virginia Emory when she passed. But she was um, Clinton's first nominee to run the Voting Rights Division uh, back in 1993, I guess. But she had this radical idea. She was accused of being a socialist, European, which is the same thing as a socialist. Right, Richard? Um, so um, she was advocating in part for multi-member districts in order to improve at that time, and this is now 30 years ago, uh, partisan gerrymandering. And she got just excoriated for this radical idea. Um, so thank you for bringing up the example of Oregon. I should have brought. Yeah, I think multi-member districts hold great potential um, because it, you know, it, it radically reduces the need, the need for gerrymandering because you don't need to anymore. So in Oregon, we have seven seats. Seven, I think. But yeah, you carve up. So like with a state with six, you just have two districts with three members, and yeah, it it allows groups to create alliances across, so if you have smaller minority groups, they could ally, um, or, or minority forces, you could kind of form a majority. I, I'm surprised we haven't had more conversations about multi-member districts, but you bump into, and if you have conversations like this with folks, um, talk with them, it's, it, it's, you run into this, I need to have a member that is in my geographic place. Now I'll tell you, what's your name again? I'm Dylan. Dylan. If you're advocating on this, I'll suggest some rhetoric for you. But one of the rhetoric is, are Dylan, 
Are all of your interests attached to your postal address? Are you not a commuter? Do you pass through other parts of this district? Do you bicycle? Do you have kids in school? Do you play soccer? Do you play, like? We interact with people all around, and do, but this idea that all of our interests are tied, that is like a pre-industrial age. I mean, literally, it's a pre-industrial age notion of political interests. And multi-member districts, to me, I like them because they don't make you go all the way to PR, right? But they get closer. Um, Britain could, I think, benefit from them as well. And it, it really allows us to move away. It allows us to um, implement systems like ranked choice voting that work better under those areas. I like them, but I don't know. We'll see. So Paul, we got time for one more. Yes, question. go ahead. I mean, I like, uh, like MMP too, but um, like, because it's like better than ranked choice voting, but I thought like it was illegal, like federally in the US or something like that. Like didn't Congress pass a law at like some point yeah. saying we can't make multi-number districts? Yeah, you may be right on that. There's something in there, isn't there? Yeah. I may be, you may be right. Um, you may be right. There may be a barrier on that. I just, we, you know, as I said, to, to, to close, you know, we have a charter reform on the ballot in Portland and we're, they're proposing to get rid of this really archaic governance system that we use in the city, but they've tied it to STV, single transferable vote, which is like ranked choice voting with multiple members. So anyway, um, and the difficulty that folks that I think are smart and politically savvy have in breaking the first past the post mold Oh, well, if all you need is 25% of the votes to win, you're just going to run for that 25%, and oh, that's extreme and sexy, but for the incentive to get more than 25%, or someone said, oh, if you can get 25% of the electorate to rank the same candidates, one, two, three, that 25% will elect all three candidates. And I said, but what's happening with the other 75% of the electorate? Are they just, like, asleep? Like, you, so people have a very hard time... You know, the reason I like new institutionalism, the way to think about the world, is it helps you think about yourself as well. That we are also bound by some of these rules. And sometimes to change things, you have to figure out what those boundaries are and bump up against them. And, you know, you just have to have an open conversation about what those boundaries are. Okay. Anyway. Well, I'm afraid our time's up. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Before, thank you.